Hi students, welcome to the notes on ionic compounds. Let's get started. Get out your science notebook and write the essential question at the top of the page. How do we determine ionic compound formulas and names? In order to talk about this, let's take a little bit of a review about compounds we learned in a previous module. A compound, as you recall, is a substance made from two or more different types of elements that are chemically bonded. Now that's important. They have to be put together to make one new substance that can't be separated. There are two types of substance, two types of compounds that we're going to be learning about. The one of them is ionic compounds, which we're learning about in this module. And in a different module, we'll learn about covalent compounds. In order to understand compounds thoroughly, we need to understand why atoms form bonds. And a big part of that deals with the octet rule. All atoms will naturally fill their outermost orbit, or we call that the valence, with eight electrons, which is why it's called an octet. And that's for most atoms. There are a few exceptions here or there. For example, hydrogen and helium, they only want two, even though we still call that an octet. Now, beware of the word fill. A lot of people think fill always means to take, but atoms can either gain or lose electrons to do so in ionic compounds. In fact, in ionic compounds, metals give electrons in order to get a full valence because they have a full valence below their shell. Nonmetals, on the other hand, take electrons to fill their valence up to the highest level. This is what we're going to explore about a little bit more. Let's take a look at the periodic table and all of the different valence electrons elements have. You might recall that we can use the periodic table to determine quickly the valence of any element. Elements in group 1 have 1 valence, and elements in group 18 have 8 valence, except for helium, which only have 2. Now, elements can become charged, and this happens in ionic bonds. And if you look on the periodic table, you can kind of see a pattern. Metals give electrons. They become cations. They become positively charged. Elements in group one only have one valence electron. So they're going to give up that one valence electron to nonmetals and become positive one charge. The alkaline earth metals, or the group two column, they give away two electrons and they become positive two. Elements in group 13, we're going to skip the transition metals for a second, but elements in group 13 have three valence electrons. So they're going to give away those three valence electrons and become positive three charge. It's a lot easier for them to give away electrons to go to a lower energy level to get a full valence than to gain electrons. The nonmetals, on the other hand, become anions. They take electrons, so they become more negatively charged. Elements in group 15 have five valence electrons, so it's easy for them to get three more electrons and become negative three charge. Elements in group 16 become negative two, and group 17 become negative one for similar reasons. They're very close to getting their full valence, so they just need either one or two more extra valence electrons. The noble gases, on the other hand, don't have a charge. They don't become charged because they're full, including helium. We would say that they are already fulfilled their octet. Let's take a look at our periodic table, the one we use in class, and all of the different elements. If you have a periodic table, this might be a good time to actually write these charges on your table so you have it as a reference to quickly know it. But if you understand valence, you might be able to figure it out. Now, all the transition metals, that's groups 3 through 12, all the other metals in groups 13 through 16, as well as the metalloids, are kind of special. They don't have predictable charges like the others because their valence electrons vary, and it's kind of weird what they do with their electrons. A lot of their electrons fall to a lower level. Now, there are some exceptions. If you take a look at what I have highlighted here in green, these ones do have predictable charges. So we can write those charges on our periodic table and be pretty confident that that's the charges that they'll become. We'll talk more about transition metals and using them to make ionic compounds in a different module as well. Now I wanna talk about ionic compounds. We talked a lot about charges because ionic compounds follow a rule of zero charge. And this helps us really easily determine the compound formula of any ionic compound. Each element in an ionic compound will continue to attract enough atoms of the opposite type until their ratios become basically an overall charge equaling zero. If you take a look at the example down here, sodium has a charge of positive one and chlorine has a charge of negative one. We only need a ratio of one of each in order to get them to come together so their charges cancel out. So their formula would be NaCl. We typically wouldn't write the charge next to a compound because all compounds, at least ionic compounds, should have a charge of zero, but I'm just writing it there to help you out. 
Let's take a look at an example where the charges aren't one to one, where it's a little bit more challenging. Follow along with me here. The question is, what is the formula for a compound made from lithium and nitrogen? The first step you should probably do is use the periodic table and predict the charges. You can also do it based on the valence electrons, which I'm showing here. You can probably predict that lithium will become positive one because it's going to lose its valence electron. It's in the first column on the periodic table. Nitrogen is in the 15th column, it has five valence electrons. It's gonna actually gain three valence, gain three valence electrons. So its predictable charge is negative three. Now, using those charges, let's try to figure out a ratio will there, where they will cancel each other out. Lithium being positive 1 and nitrogen being negative 3 means that a 1 to 1 ratio isn't going to work here. And that's why I have these puzzle pieces here, just to kind of give you an idea of how that ratio works. Well, if you think about it, we probably need three total lithiums in order to cancel out the one nitrogen. Nitrogen has a larger charge than lithium does. So that's our ratio. Our ratio is going to be three lithiums to one nitrogen. Knowing that, it becomes really easy to do the last thing. We're going to write a compound formula. And the compound formula is Li3n. The little three represents that there are three lithiums in this compound attached to one nitrogen. And you can see here, this is the, the Lewis dot structure, or we call it the electron dot structure, that shows that whole process of electrons being taken and gained by nitrogen or given by lithium. All right, let's go to ionic compound formulas and names. So now we've learned a little bit about a quick way to write ionic compound formulas. How do we name them? Well, the general rule, we always put the metal element first, and then we put the nonmetal, and then we typically change the ending to ide. A few examples of this, um, in the last example we just did Li3N, we would call that lithium nitride. And again, that's lithium and nitrogen, but we change the ending to ide. Another example will be Al203 that's made of aluminum and oxygen, so we're going to call that aluminum oxide. The last one you're probably familiar with, NaCl, is sodium and chlorine, but we call it sodium chloride. There's no real hint to, to tell where ide goes. It should just kind of flow off your tongue. For example, you wouldn't call it oxygen ide. It just is oxide. The more you do these problems, the more you'll get used to using the word ide in ionic compound names. All right, here's an example that I want you to try. See if you can pause this video right now and determine an answer to this question without any help. Then you can unpause the video, follow along to make sure you did it correctly. Did you pause the video? I really implore you to try to do this by yourself. That's the best way to learn, to rack your brain a little bit and try to solve this puzzle and look for patterns. But let me go ahead and help you if you are struggling. It says here, determine the chemical formula for a compound between this metal and nonmetal. So we have magnesium, which is our metal, and chlorine, which is a nonmetal. That's a big hint to let us know that this is an ionic compound because we're dealing with a metal and a nonmetal. Later when we deal with covalent compounds, it won't be between metals and nonmetals. All right, we're also going to need to draw the electron dot structure and determine the chemical name. So let's start with finding the compound formula. So I do that. I'm going to first figure out what the charges are. Looking on the periodic table, magnesium is in the second column. It has a plus two charge. It's a metal. Metals become cations. Chlorine, on the other hand, becomes a minus one charge. It's in group 17. It has 17 valence electrons, and it wants to gain one more. So these are the predictable charges that these two elements are going to become. And I'm going to write them up here as kind of a side note. Now, knowing that, I can figure out the ratio that I would need of each for them to cancel it out. Magnesium is worth more. It's worth more in terms of charge. Chlorine, on the other hand, is only worth minus one. So I'm going to need more chlorines in order to counteract that one, that one positive two magnesium. In fact, I need two total chlorines. So our ratio here is one magnesium to two chlorines, which really easy lets us write a chemical formula for this ionic compound. This is MgCl with a little two. All right, so how do we draw the Lewis dot structure? Let's explain this by showing the valence electrons. Here's magnesium with its two valence electrons. And here's both of those chlorines, right? Our chemical formula lets us know that we actually are going to need two chlorines to finish this. So you can kind of predict what's going on here. Magnesium is going to lose its two valence electrons, one to each of the chlorines. That means magnesium is going to become positive two charge. Chlorine is going to become each minus one charge, and they'll attach to each other ionically.
Now the name MgCl is two, it's called magnesium chloride. And we're following the name rules where we always put the metal first, magnesium, and then we put the non-metal last, so that's chlorine, but we change the ending to ide, so it's magnesium chloride. All right, that leads us to the end of our notes. This is a good time to review and highlight key terms. If you have any questions, maybe ponder those questions and write them down. Try to figure out answers to those questions. Ask people, ask your instructor or ask other students and try to figure out the answers to those questions. Finally, summarize and answer the essential question. It's a deep question that might require some examples. See if you can come up with some examples on your own. All right, good luck.